be uh, Lucas Clark. He's a uh, fourth year uh, neurology resident. And uh, Lucas and I started an internship together. We suffered together for a year before we got to separate on our ways. So he's going to talk to us uh, about uh, nystagmus and uh, ataxia. You know how to flip this. morning. Uh, it's a pleasure being here today. Um, it may be a question for most of you what relevance this topic may have to your own clinical practice, um, but I feel like it is quite relevant in the sense that uh, many of the patients that uh, we'll be talking about here uh, will pr first present to an ophthalmologist probably before seeing a neurologist uh, because of their eye complaints. Um, and it's also quite possible that the neurologists that you might be working with in the community may not be familiar with uh, these syndromes and uh, it would be a good basis for a discussion with them. So I'd like to present to you first uh, a man, uh, 78 years old, who is a uh, retired obstetrician who uh, has a history of actually seeing the ophthalmologist for a long time because of Fuchs dystrophy in both of his eyes as well as uh, developing binocular diplopia uh, later on in his career, um, which was a, a significant limitation to his practice. Um, but the reason why he came to see us in the neuro-ophthalmology clinic was because he had five, or he had these episodes, uh, usually lasting about five days and about four times per year, where he'd wake up in the middle of the night and he couldn't walk uh, to the bathroom. He'd stagger to the bathroom and had a very difficult time um, with ataxia. And this would usually last for a few days and then he'd get back to his baseline, but never quite perfect. Um, his baseline was usually a little off. So significantly, his family is also affected with, uh, or his sister is also had problems with ataxia, uh, only ones that we're aware of. Um, and there he couldn't really identify any uh, triggers for this problem. So uh, his physical examination was very significant for uh, limited up gaze as well as saccadic pursuit and a 10 prism diopter uh, isotropia on the left side as well as, uh, this was the most significant finding, and I wish I could have found a good um, video of this, or I could have videotaped him while he was in the clinic with us, but he had variable nystagmus. It was not uh, gaze-evoked nystagmus, and it, it changed all around uh, in whatever position he was, and he, he uh, didn't notice it at all, and he had actually had hearing and balance testing uh, where they noted that as well, um, but couldn't really uh, identify any vestibular problem uh, prior to coming to see us. He also had a very wide-based gait and uh, difficulty uh, hitting a target at 15 feet, and uh, he had a terminal tremor in his right arm more than his left. So this is an MRI image of his brain that he had had prior to coming to see us, and you'll notice very prominently that there is uh, significant midline atrophy of his cerebellum, as well as actually generalized atrophy of his brain, <coughs> but it's significant for his ataxic problem, excuse me. <coughs> so um, this brings me to the discussion of these episodic ataxic syndromes that are primar primary in nature. So they usually consist of these spells of incoordination as well as uh, they can sometimes also have uh, weakness and dystonia associated with them um, and in certain cases seizures as well. Uh, the incidence is fairly rare, about one in 100,000 people 
in at least for the uh, episodic ataxias one and two, and now there are at least six known episodic ataxias, but the other three or four are not uh, are not really clinically relevant. They've only been described in uh, one or two families at least. Um, so uh, there are also other people with episodic ataxia that don't have any intraatrial signs, and usually, or it's thought that these probably uh, represent other entities. Um, and they think that the pathology uh, mostly lies in the Purkinje cells of the cerebellum, um, where there are multiple different uh, cellular synaptic inputs there. So, oh, unfortunately, this got cut off a little bit, but um, we can see kind of the spectrum of the episodic ataxies here. And um, I want to focus on, uh, highlighted in red, uh, one and two. Um, you can see very clearly that, oh, well, I guess there's no camera up here. Or yeah, you can see very clearly that uh, the duration of the episodic episodes is much shorter in uh, type 1 than in type 2. And uh, the age at onset is much lower uh, in type 1 than type 2 as well. But both of them uh, seem to occur in young adulthood um, more commonly. Uh, it's also significant that uh, there's a, uh, a difference in genes that uh, EA1 is a potassium channel problem and EA2 is a calcium channel problem. And we'll go th into this in a little bit more detail. So they're both uh, autosomal dominant diseases and uh, in EA1 it's usually actually in childhood that they present and uh, it's thought that the potassium channel that's affected uh, is in the, or is predominantly expressed in the cerebellum and uh, the hippocampus, but also is in the motor neurons. Now, what you want to think about with this uh, disease, besides it being brief, um, multiple episodes at a time, and that it starts at a young age, is that they will also uh, present with neuromyotonia or myotrimia, which is um, uh, discharges of uh, the muscles underneath the skin that gives sort of a, a rippling appearance of the skin on the surface. Um, and, and this disorder may also present with epilepsy and is sometimes responsive to acetazolamine. Sorry that the citation isn't showing up on the bottom very well. Um, and in terms of episodic ataxia 2, this disorder is actually very interesting because uh, the gene that it's located at, and we'll talk about this in a second, is uh, the calcium channel uh, alpha-1 subunit, which uh, co-locates with two other disorders, familial hemiplegic migraine 1, as well as spinal cerebellar ataxia 6, and there are uh, different alleles of this that are associated with the different disorders. It's a lot more common than EA1, um, and it's usually actually a truncation mutation. That'll be important in a second. Um, so the, the episodes of ataxia are usually a lot longer, and they're also triggered by physical or emotional stress. Um, and there's usually interatrial nystagmus in these patients and uh, can be very responsive to acetazolamide. So um, the episodes that they have are, are usually very, uh, or can be very different uh, depending on the patient and uh, actually even um, within families, the, the penetration of this uh, disorder can be very different. Uh, but usually has uh, vertigo, nausea, and vomiting, and headache associated with it. Um, and uh, also, Usually you don't, um, or you don't see uh, spontaneous nystagmus interictally, but there is gaze-evoked nystagmus. So it's important in these patients to examine uh, whether you can uh, 
provoke the uh, Knights Agnes by having them uh, lean forward in the chair. Um, usually it also has a prominent progressive ataxia and an evaluation with an EMG can also be very helpful in assessing whether uh, the syndrome is uh, at play. Um, so also in this, uh, at the same allele is uh, a missense mutation that can cause hemiplegic migraine and I don't want to really emphasize this too much, uh, just that the entity exists and actually can present uh, in the same family as the patients with uh, episodic ataxia. Um, so, um, and sometimes can actually present in the same person that they can have uh, ataxic episodes and hemiplegic migraine episodes. Um, with, the, uh, with spinocerebellar ataxia type six, this is actually what I think our patient presented with. Um, they usually present uh, at a much older age. Uh, it's usually a much milder disease than all of the other spinal cerebellar ataxias, and it's usually only uh, an ataxia rather than uh, a combined disorder. Um, usually, or it can be fluctuating and episodic, uh, just like we saw in this patient. And there can be a decrease in vibration and position sense, or uh, usually more distally. The eye movement findings, which are very important, are that they, uh, in some cases, range from uh, difficulty fixating on uh, moving objects uh, to diplopia, or or with marked without marked uh, ductional de uh, deficits. So they also have very prominent interacral nice diagnosis. And it's thought that uh, this disorder is actually due to uh, alternative splicing uh, associated with the, the wrong uh, polyglutamine expansion. So, uh, and that's why it's thought that it uh, probably presents much later in life. Um, so uh, basically the key points and thinking about these episodic ataxic disorders are that uh, the age at onset varies quite considerably. Uh, if the patient is uh, elderly in presentation, uh, we definitely want to think about spinal cerebellar ataxia type six. Uh, the other two uh, present much earlier in life uh, and usually are associated with uh, more severe symptoms uh, and other disorders. Um, you want to ask about precipitating factors for it. Uh, the aura of falling is uh, not path mnemonic, but is classic for episodic ataxia one. Uh, there may also be, or you also want to make sure that you uh, test whether the patient has up gaze limitation, uh, whether there's gaze evoked nystagmus nice and spontaneous uh, nystagmus. Nice and then um, ultimately the patient should be referred uh, for an EMG uh, for additional ev evidence. And a lot of these patients will respond well to acetazolamide, so it's a, a uh, treatable uh, neurologic disorder. So that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? That's a good question. So uh, acetazolamide is a carbonic enhance or, or carbonic acid uh, reductase inhibitor. And uh, the thought is that it actually stabilizes the membrane. So it doesn't actually interact with the potassium channel or the calcium channel directly, but uh, by uh, increasing that membrane potential, it uh, decreases the, the uh, spontaneous firing that Um, I think uh, essentially it is a change in pH in, in the sense that uh, there are more uh, cations uh, present there than uh, there would be otherwise. Uh, 
Um, yeah, no, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think I think there definitely are uh, imaging characteristics of that are nonspecific of cerebellar degeneration that we see in the age, especially uh, as the disease progresses. But uh, the lack of neuroimaging findings does not uh, tell you uh, that this is not a uh, spinal cerebellar ataxia or episodic ataxia. But, but clearly, if the imaging findings are present, they help in cinching your diagnosis. 